Hey everyone, Jody here. This is a best of episode, one of our favorites from the archives. We're giving ourselves the final week or so of summer off, and we will be back with new episodes after Labor Day. But for now, enjoy. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, 1894, Thomas H. Boston Corbett is presumed dead in Minnesota. He is the victim of what came to be known as the Great Hinkley Fire. This was a massive forest fire which wiped out the town of Hinkley, Minnesota, and the surrounding forest. Somewhere between 450, 500 people died in that fire, and among the names listed was Boston Corbett. Now, what makes Boston Corbett notable? Why wasn't he just another relatively anonymous death in this tragic fire? Well, he'd faded a bit into obscurity by the time he got to Minnesota, but in the previous decades, Corbett had come to be known and call himself Lincoln's Avenger. Boston Corbett was the man who killed John Wilkes Booth days after Booth had assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Corbett was part of a regiment that cornered Booth on a Virginia farm. If you know this story, they had orders not to kill Booth, but Corbett claims at least that he nevertheless took a fatal shot and thus became the man who avenged Abraham Lincoln's death. And in the years and decades since, that act really seemed to consume him for better and really mostly, as we'll discuss, for worse. So... Here to discuss, as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Um, Thomas H. Boston Corbett. We're going to call him Boston Corbett from now on. That's what most people called him. Um, I suppose we should start with Booth's death, the days after Mm -hmm. Lincoln's assassination. How does Booth finally get cornered, Mm. captured, and killed? Mm. I mean, it's it's, a... probably one of the greatest manhunts in American history. Abraham Lincoln has died, and people are trying to find uh, John Wilkes Booth wherever they think he might be. And so he is on the run. He actually ends up in a man's farm by the name of Richard Garrett and is hiding in sort of a barn and and gets cornered by this regiment. Um, And he refuses to come out. And so one of the tactics they used to get him to try to come out is they they set um, parts of the barn on fire. And even still, he refuses. And it's not clear exactly how he is killed, but he's shot in the back of of the head. And uh, Corbett is the one who claims to have shot him in this process. He says that that John Wilkes Booth was trying to take aim at him, and so he shot in self-defense. But again, it's a little murky. And it seems like at that point, Booth was dragged out of the barn because he lives for another two hours with this gunshot to the head. It's a pretty agonizing death. Um, But when the unit is asked who who did this, who shot him, Corbett's the one who steps forward and says he's the shooter. And when his commander says, why did you violate this order? He says, Providence directed me. No. Mm. Which is a little bit of a hint into how um, mm-hmm. the mind of um, yeah. Corbett works. Um, we should maybe do an episode specifically on the Booth escape and the Booth mm-hmm. manhunt and so forth. Because I, I I don't know this right off the top of my head, but I think the Garretts were really interesting people too. The farm and there was like questions about whether they were hiding him or, mm-hmm. or when they tipped him off and and so forth. But um, and, and worth um, saying that John Wilkes yeah. Booth was a, a pretty famous actor, so very yeah. recognizable yeah. as well. So hiding him was a tricky thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, and and it, and it is true that Garrett and I think the twelve year old son, his twelve year old son, who were there, um, they they contradicted Corbett's testimony because Corbett had claimed that he was sort of maybe <coughs> acting in self defense and that, mm-hmm. that Booth he had seen Booth reach for a gun and so forth, and so um, they contradicted that. So you know, it thus starts this interesting thing of both of Corbett kind of claiming that he did this, mm-hmm. maybe claiming self defense, but then also really realizing like. He eventually starts calling himself Lincoln's Avenger. He really starting to embrace this. But um, to get through some of the details, I mean, Corbett is brought to trial, or so to speak. You know, there are, there are repercussions here because, again, he was contradicting orders to keep Booth, to capture Booth alive, right? Right. He's taken directly to the Secretary of War. Um, at the time, it was Ed- Edwin Stanton. And he gives that 
uh, recounting that you were just saying, Jody, he says, you know, it was him or me. He was going to shoot me if I didn't shoot him. He claims that he had tried to just disable Booth and not kill him, um, but the, the his arm slipped or Booth moved. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you want to understand the legend of Lincoln's <coughs> Avenger that comes out of this, Stanton's response is pretty dramatic. Mm-hmm. He pauses and then he says... The rebel is dead. The patriot lives. He has spared the country expense, continued excitement and trouble. Discharge the patriot. So very mm. dramatic. <laughs> that is. That is. But it's also a way of saying, like, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Right. He, eventually, he was going to get, uh, you know, executed, if not assassinated. And so uh, the whole idea of taking him alive would have only been to sort of question him about intent. But even his intent was clear. So, you know, the fact that he was gone, it was sort of like, okay, well, at least he's captured and we don't have to spend more dollars trying to uh, investigate either the murder of Lincoln or the murder of John Wilkes Booth. Yeah. Um, But yeah, calling him, Stanton calling him in that moment, you know, the patriot um, Mm -hmm. really does set, you know, as we've said, like so often history starts to just write itself in those moments and that choice. I mean, can, can you imagine the counterfactual of if, Corbett had now gone on trial, right? Yeah. And the one person in the aftermath of Lincoln's cessation now sort of on trial is the guy who killed Booth. I mean, that would have been, who knows what, what yeah. the fallout yeah. of that would have been. But instead, you know, he walks out of the War Department after this acquittal, and he's greeted by this large cheering crowd. He's taken to the famous photographer Matthew Brady's studio to have his portrait taken. People are asking for autographs. It really is this atmosphere of... Heroics, right? He's yeah. he's cheered he's a as a as a as a hero, yeah. And people want to purchase. People want to buy the gun that he mm-hmm. used. I mean, it's it is people saw him as like a savior in a way, or or someone that redeemed something that was lost. And so he kind of rides that fame wave as much as he possibly can. Yeah. to hearing my voice on the world bringing you interviews from around the globe and you hear me reporting environment and climate news i'm carolyn beeler and i'm marco werman we're now with you hosting the world together more global journalism with a fresh new sound listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts it's funny as i'm Thinking about this story, I'm reminded of Robert Ford, the, the <coughs> guy who killed Jesse James. And Robert Ford, at least according to the movie, and I think according to the legend, kind of like had this sort of like, I was this avenging angel. Mm. But then it starts to turn on him and starts to get sinister and it starts to consume him. And he's like mm. trying to sell pictures of Jesse James's dead body. I don't know. Mm. I think I'm I think I'm conflating these vibes in my head. <laughs> but I, think I think it is sort of it is sort of similar. Corbett gets a little bit of money. Yeah. You know, there was a a ransom out for um, John Wilkes Booth, and the money is about $100,000. He gets a portion of that. He gets, you know, about $1,600, $1,653, which in today's money is like $29,000. So it's it's not nothing. It's a significant amount of money in which he can, um, you know, sort of fund any endeavor he wanted to do after that. Yeah. But the endeavor he wants to fund is really <laughs> just being Boston Corbett, right? Yeah, and right. that really is kind of, I think we can now start a sort of tour of his very twisted and tragic. Disturbed um, life. Disturbed, uh, you know, aftermath of this, including, you know, um, we've hinted at it a little bit, but including the sort of introduction of real biblical kind of overtones here. And so he refers to himself as the avenging angel, but he talks about how it was God who avenged Abraham Lincoln, not me. You know, what a God we have that he willed me to do this and so forth. Um, And then he goes on, I guess at one point he becomes a preacher touring the country, but his behavior becomes, you know, I think more and more fanatical um, Mm -hmm. in every sense. Erratic. He, I mean, he can't keep a job. And this this was before he joined the military. But certainly after, he is such a religious fanatic 
that he's oftentimes let go because he won't stop um, proselytizing on the job or he'll stop in the middle of a job to to pray or to sing songs or to chastise certain people for their, you know, um, beliefs. And so he becomes a little unhinged and it's it's hard to sort of get him to um, to stay in reality. And um, he he commits a lot of um, heinous acts. I, I mean, one of the things that's most disturbing is that he castrates himself with a pair of scissors. He wanted to keep himself pure and thought that his sexual thoughts were keeping him in a life of sin. And so he does this incredible act that should have tipped a lot of people off that he was not <laughs> mentally well. <laughs> that he was not mentally well, that he needed to get some help, um, real help. And it kind of takes too long for him to actually get that if he gets it at all. Can can I just tell our listeners that, you know, we have these prep documents where we have information about the story that Jacob Feldman puts together. They're brilliant. And in it, you know, there's this line that says, in order to avoid sexual temptation, Corbett castrated himself with a pair of scissors. And Kelly just <laughs> does one of those Google Doc comments, right? She highlights the sentence and adds a comment in Google Doc. And the Google Doc comment is just, oh, God. <laughs> G-A-W-D, exclamation point, exclamation point. Yeah, that's, that's the appropriate response. Yes. It's uh, I mean, that's like, whoa, it's, whoa, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It There's was an a- unexpected turn in the story. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But I think it's worth going back into his history a little bit to make sense of this, because religious zealotry can come from a lot of different places. But in this case, you know, Boston Corbett's trade was as a milliner. Um, so he was a hat maker. And we all know from uh, Alice in Wonderland, this this phrase, the Mad Hatter. Well, that was mm-hmm. linked to the way that millinery worked, which was that it was heavily dependent on mercury. And so people who made hats Im- Im- imbibed a lot of mercury through their skin, through the mm-hmm. fumes. And it causes all kinds of things. It causes hallucinations. It causes psychiatric breaks and it's as he's imbibing all of these these mercuries, solids, and fumes that he begins to display this religious zealotry where he stops to preach in the middle of work, where he castrates himself. Like, this is something that is building. And then he goes back to millinery after the war. And so he's back in that very toxic environment. Okay, oh, hold on. I have to stop you. I was today years old when I realized <laughs> that the Mad Hatter reference <laughs> uh-huh. is about the toxic chemicals that go into hat making. What? Like, Isn't that wild? That I wild. think, yeah. I think Mad Hatter was a thing. You know, Mad Hatter's disease was a thing wow. for a while, and then they wrote it as a wrote it as a character. But there you go. Yeah, because there's a wow. phrase like "mad as a hatter," and yeah. it comes from from this idea. Um, so I, I think it's. You know, he could have also yeah. had other psychological problems. He does end up, he becomes a Methodist preacher for a while. He goes off and he homesteads in Kansas, and then he ends up in an asylum um, because he yeah. is becoming increasingly erratic and people are worried that he's a danger to himself and others. Yeah. And, you know, to connect this to the death of um, Booth, you know, that I get, and this is speculation and this is kind of the, the sort of loss to history, but, you know, in many, in some ways, you can look at he kills Booth, and there's a there's a sort of breaking point there, and it consumes him. And I think that's certainly part of the story. But it's also kind of like who is the kind of person who would maybe defy orders and take a shot at Booth, and then start mm. to tell a story. You know, p- maybe someone who was unwell to begin with. And mm. so, you know, I think that's part that's part of the story here. Um, so yeah, we've described some of the kind of uh, paths he goes down um, and the sort of itinerant life he leads. He is throughout. I mean, I just like. This, this image is really striking to me, but he also is from time to time, you know, he gives lectures about the shooting of Booth and he has like lantern slides and he goes into Sunday schools or women's groups or tent revival meetings and he gives these little lectures. And then often apparently like he just takes it too far and people get really put off by him or he gets mm-hmm. in fights. Uh, there's an incident where he's at the Kansas House of Representatives and he's reportedly brandishes a gun and he confronts people and, you know, he is... um. He is unwell. And and as you said, Nikki, he ends up in the Topeka Asylum for the Insane. And then he starts to float around and eventually ends up 
in Hinckley in eastern Minnesota, reportedly just kind of like living in the in the woods um, mm-hmm. outside of Hinckley. And then there is this Hinckley fire. Um, and may, maybe fitting, you know, um, that's how John Wilkes Booth died <laughs> uh, under <laughs> mysterious circumstances consumed yeah. by fire. And there is no official record. You know, there is there is a reference to a Thomas Corbett appearing on the list of dead and missing in the Hinckley fire. But, you know, beyond that, there is no definitive, definitive proof that it was Lincoln's Avenger, this man who mm. who died in that in that fire. Um, and that actually leads to what a number of people in the years after sort of claiming that, oh, no, I'm actually I'm actually this guy. I'm actually this guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a lot of of imitators who come mm-hmm. out of the word work after. I mean, yeah. there's money to be made, y'all. <laughs> there's money to be yeah, made <laughs> and telling these really fantastical stories about, you know, being shot at and then taking the shot and, you know, all of that. I mean, it's, it's, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think as a, as a button on this whole thing, um, it is worth noting that it's not until 1941 that the U.S. government finally bans using mercury in the making of hats. <laughs> Way too late. 1941. Way, way too, too late. late. Yeah. Way too yeah. late. Why do you need mercury to make a hat? Make it make sense for me. I don't understand. Is it not leather? Is it not cotton? <laughs> like, what are I'm we sure, doing? I'm sure the milliners in our audience will write in and explain. Yes, we want the, uh, the explanation. And then, oh, man. Um, in the late 50s, uh, a Boy Scout troop outside of Concordia, Kansas, built a roadside monument to Corbett um, located in the region where he had sort of ended up in Kansas. And there was a small sign there. Um, and it is, by all reports, still there. And that might be the only place where there's a sort of monument or plaque to, to Corbett. But mm. I mean, should I read what the plaque says? Yeah, yeah. It says, Boston Corbett Dugout, 60 yards south, is the site of the dugout home of Boston Corbett, who as a soldier shot John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of President Lincoln, and then erected by the Boy Scout Troop 31, Concordia, Kansas, 1958. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Still not going. <laughs> yeah, still not going. Still not you got going. the picture. It's fine. We got the picture. Uh, but yeah, so, um, uh, let me tell you, Concordia, Kansas, it's... It's out there. Um, <laughs> and uh, this dugout where he lived. But apparently there were two six shooters on the monument and those were stolen in the 2000s. But um, but yeah, it's there. So if anyone's been, been by, let us know. Wow. Okay. That brings us to the end of the tale of Boston Corbett, Lincoln's Avenger. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure.